to Positive Nerd Podcast, the podcast that takes the big negative arguments that divide fandoms and aims to unite them with sheer love and positivity. And I am your host, <laughs> Claire Lim, and I've got my co-host here as always, Liz! Yay. Hello! Yay! Liz is here! So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight, you guys, just to give you a rundown of Das Pod. So on Positive Nerd tonight, we have the subject is Birds of Prey going to fail. <sighs> that's a very strong subject. So that's <laughs> that's subject number one uh, because it's topical since we've got Birds of Prey coming out very soon. Next we have Liz's Comic Corner. Uh, we have got uh, Deadpool the End or the yeah so Deadpool the End uh, by Joe Kelly. So. That was really fun, and we both read that this week. And finally, we're going to end on no more female reboots or remakes. Ugh. So that's what we're going to end on, right? Okay, so that's what we've got coming up. Okay, Liz, let's get straight into this. Okay, let's talk about Birds of Prey. Okay, so let's start with the tweets first. Um, you chose out these tweets, Liz. I'm going to read them out for you. Uh, there's there's a two-pronged attack during this. First of all, there's the idea of the ticket sales. So this is a tweet from uh, someone called Matt. Nobody buying Birds of Prey tickets. Not the woke culture. Not Harley Quinn fans. Not DCEU fans. Not comic book fans. And sure as heck, not the Batman fans. So that's tweet number one. Tweet number two I found really strange. Uh, this, is, this is Hunter240X. Hunter says, So I looked at my local theatre again to see how many tickets were sold uh, for this th- uh, Thursday screenings. By the way, uh, Hunter, spell Thursday, right? Anyway, uh, Birds of Prey, days away, four showings equals 432 seats. Tickets sold, 19. Sonic Movie, two weeks away, three shows equals 324. Tickets sold, eight. Not that these numbers matter, But interesting. Now, oh my God, Liz, everyone's going frigging mad over the ticket sales thing. Give me your thoughts on this. Go for it. Uh, It is a strange thing. It's it's a strange thing that I started noticing popping up in my Twitter feed all last week um, because that I I think maybe that first tweet you read out kind of kind of made some waves. And then all these other people started checking their local cinemas and chiming in. Uh, with oh like you know well, this is how many tickets have sold at my local cinema and <laughs> this is how you know and uh, and people starting to check in New York and in Los Angeles and places you know where you would expect tickets to sell well um, and you know it, it seemed as though not that many tickets have sold but uh, then you kind of had you know some comeback from that uh, people posting that uh, Adam tickets uh, which is a uh, like a ticket app, I believe. Yes. Um, said, uh, well, actually, as you can see, this has actually outpaced Wonder Woman and Suicide Squad for ticket sales so far. So mm. actually, it's not doing so bad. And there's some debate about, you know, about pre-sales in general. Um, apparently, February is a very slow time for tickets Fair. selling to to films anyway. Um, and you know, kind of, that's been an increasing thing over the last couple of years. So, uh, and and it opened up a conversation about how people actually go about, you know, buying their tickets. Do do many people really buy tickets ahead of time or do they just show up to the cinema and buy them in person at the cinema, which is something that I do personally. Ugh. And a lot of people chiming in to say, well, that's what I do as well. So, <laughs> um, so it's really kind of hard to get a handle on whether or not this is a big deal in any way. It is so daft. First of all, like when it comes to and i think this is something this is a very new topic because because social media exists we analyze strange things about um, films moving to different studios ticket sales all of these things that i know you or i did not give a shit about when we were 12 you know i didn't care if my local cinema was full to the brim or not selling any tickets for a film it is so ridiculous and i'm sorry i'm sorry you have to have a lot of frigging time in your hands if you're checking your local cinema for the ticket sales you sad bastards just go see the film i know 
I know. It is really funny. It is really funny because, um, yeah, I mean, it's just something that I never would have thought to do, you know, uh, and wouldn't have thought to do, you know, were it not for, you know, all these people on Twitter, uh, you know, going to personally investigate the ticket sales of Birds of Prey at their local cinema. Uh, imagine, like, who do you phone up? Like, okay, Liz, imagine we're going to find out uh, just exactly how many tickets Birds of Prey sold. Um, hi there, uh, so my name's Claire. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to speak to your, uh, you know, your manager. So tell me, first of all, what's the capacity of the cinema versus how many tickets you've sold? Boo! Hung up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It is so strange. Um, and to be honest, uh, I, I believe these tweets started trending just before um, they started to in the preview screenings for Birds of Prey. And people were allowed to talk about it a little bit in their tweets and stuff. And uh, And so, you know, so that sort of happened. And then, you know, within a few days, people started posting their reactions to having seen the film early. And the reactions are super positive yes so a lot of people i feel might hang on until they get a feel for what people actually think of the film before they invest in a ticket um i mean i think you're right so just to pick up on something you said earlier you made a point about how we don't buy tickets some people don't buy tickets in advance um no. i tend to rock up to the cinema uh, when i feel like it and i don't always go unless i have a press screening invite I will not see a film on opening weekend and that kind of thing. I would rather wait until it's quiet because I'm an anti-social bastard and I like to be in a quiet cinema with nobody what? bothering me, your big munching mouth, munching in my ears. And like, honestly, Liz, when I went to go see Avengers, there it was full, packed to the brim. It was opening weekend and a couple sat next to me and the woman next to me proceeded to, in her outdoor voice, speak to her boyfriend husband about every moment that was happening on screen. I oh, know. are they back in time now? Oh, look! Oh, she she's come <laughs> she's come back from from the t from the past. She's going she's going to ruin everything. And I was like, fucking shut up! Just shut uh, up! Yeah, I know, I know. Like, yeah, <sighs> that that like propels me into a murderous rage when people talk during the movie. <laughs> Um, or look at their phone during the movie, or eat during the movie, or do anything other than watch the movie during the movie. Yes! Uh, oh. So I know exactly what you mean. I like to go on, like, a quiet day in the morning, like, midweek. Um, so I'll usually go, like, if it's, you know, sort of a, you know, Wednesday midnight release, I'll go on the Thursday morning at, like, 9 a.m. or something when there's nobody else there. Um but, uh, which, you know, I like, I like the quieter screen times. If I see like, you know, that not many tickets have sold in that screening, that's mm -hmm. the one I want to go to. Same, same, um, same. I would say that everyone, I think there's a little bit of, I feel kind of sad for movies like this because I feel like there's a lot of people rooting for it to fail almost with those kind of news stories coming out. Um, it doesn't, now, I don't think you have to write positively about things all the time, you know, I don't think we have to live in this existence where we're like, you know, unicorns and rainbows, I think that's unrealistic. Uh, but I think if you are a journalist, a writer, and a movie's not come out yet, you've not seen it, try and maybe write something that's quite neutral about it, or do a piece about the comic, and, and a hopeful piece about what you want to see, and I think that's more positive. And then if you don't see it, you can write your review afterwards, and then you can trash it. It's fine then. Yeah, exactly. Because I have the feeling these people who were writing these kind of negative tweets uh, are definitely people who haven't, you know, been to a preview screening, um, and don't really have a lot to back up what they think is wrong with the film until they've seen it. Um, yes. And it seems as though the people who have seen the film and are tweeting about it have only had really positive, exciting things to say about it, which if I was on the fence about buying a ticket, those are the tweets that I'd look at and say, well, okay, that will actually sway me one way or another to make a decision about whether I'm going to pay money to see this film on opening weekend. See, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't like to see anything about a film. I've seen the tweets starting to go out because I follow a lot of pundits. I follow a lot of people that are press. Um, I actually prefer to see nothing. I th like I kind of I don't want a good or a bad. And I think when Star Wars was happening, 
it was just a wave and and I kind of got it spoiled for me from several articles even not not even people um and I was like oh now I know what happens I've still not seen the film yet I kind of I'm guessing now what the arc is so I'm like okay <laughs> been able to work it out I think we can work out what happens now from all these things but let's Let's leave the tickets thing aside. Is it because to be honest with you, I'm gonna I don't know how you feel, Liz. I'm gonna say here, see the ticket argument? It's dumb as shit. What do you think? Uh yeah. Like, you know, uh, kind of pointless to conjecture um until it comes out. Uh you won't have any kind of real accurate handle on it. And like, you know, I feel like you're right. It is kind of like in a way, it's a way to try and like sabotage it before it actually comes out. Uh but you know, if it's a good film and it looks like it probably is from the buzz that I've seen on Twitter, yeah. uh, it's it's going to do well. Yeah, I think it's a very strange it's a very strange way to think. And I think some people actually genuinely do think this way. I actually think those people are sort of small percentage, but we see them online in our feeds and it, it seems like a lot. But there are a small percentage of people who actually want things to fail, like they gleefully I think subconsciously and gleefully kind of, oh yes, oh yes, it's going to fail and then I'm going to tell everyone I was right. And it's like, yeah. why? Like, it's just a film. <laughs> it's just a I film. Know, and their argument, I think part of that argument is that, um, oh, well, DC don't know who they're marketing this film to. They don't, you know, they're not marketing it to to men who like action films and uh, they are not marketing it to women and they're not marketing it to... Uh, Batman fans and who's the market for this but uh, to be honest good films like you know uh, you know basically unite all of those things exactly. if it's a good movie all of those people will go see it because they've heard it's good like word of mouth is like really king when it comes to people actually turning out to exactly. pay for a movie now there are another set of tweets that you sent me this is the second part of this. I think this goes on from the people wanting it to fail, sabotaging it, whatever. Let's look at this. these other tweets that flared up. Um, this is not one that I found. This is one you found, and then there's another one that we both saw. So this one is from Hugh Bambino. It wasn't sent to us directly. We just find these online. It's like they told Mary Elizabeth Winstead, you can't be sexy in this movie. We don't do that here. Sorry, I had to do it in that voice because I, I feel that's how they're saying it. Now we have a picture of uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as the huntress and, and also another picture of her in a photo shoot looking sexy and then supposedly not sexy. So that was one tweet. Now let's go on to the next tweet and then let's talk about this for a second. Let's, let's, let's unpack. This is from Matthew Kaddish or Kaddish or whatever his name is. Um, you know why Birds of Prey is going to bomb just like Charlie's Angels did? Well, they've removed any sex appeal these characters had to appeal to a female girl power audience instead of the core male comic book audience. They literally don't know who they're making this movie for. Right. <laughs> Right. Now, so wait, that ties into, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go back to this tweet and just put it on screen again. You can't see the avatar, but I think you can tell by the way the light is shining off the guy's head that he's not so sexy himself. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, let's move on to that argument. First of all, right, I think from the picture I've put up now, there's a group of them and there's five of them there. We get hundreds in the back and this one. Um, they, I don't look like that. Uh, they look pretty sexy to me, actually. If we're just going to talk about sexy, uh, yeah. I like I that I don't know where that's coming from. I mean, it's like Margot Robbie, who's like gorgeous. All these like you know, surrounded by these equally gorgeous women, uh, like you know, sort of dressed in like tight outfits. Um, you know, I, I don't know. They look hot to me. Yeah, I'm like that's the thing. okay. I mean, one one lady here, uh, as you know, we can see your cleavage and everything. Is if that's not sexy enough, you're just looking at sex appeal, right? Now let's yeah. think of it in practicality. So I'm gonna go back to the tweet about Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and we've got the huntress picture here. First of all, um, I would be quite happy if I looked like that. And second of all, um, if you're going to fight people. Um, having your boobs flying everywhere is not practical, okay? It's not. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, having having like a sports pro type deal actually, you know, it's it's practical. Yeah. Um, not thinking about know, makeup like so a... much. Not thinking about that so much. 
Uh, not really thinking about the blusher and the lipstick. I think she looks frigging amazing. And I don't, yeah. I don't think I mean, she's wearing, you know, I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, uh, she's wearing like armor head to toe. Like she's, you know, it, it's, it's actually, you know, I think quite a sexy little outfit, like, but also practical. It looks like she's got some like armor on her and she would be protected in a fight to a degree. Exactly. We got to think about practicality. We're going to go back to this guy's tweet, Matthew's tweet. Um, the fact that he's like, he thinks that this film is only appealing to a girl power audience and they don't know, they clearly don't know the demographic for this film. I think that's absolute bullshit. Um, if, I mean, for God's sake, you know, movie makers are not making films for this one guy or one person. They're making films that appeal to a broad range, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it actually, you know, uh, I, from the look of it, to me, uh, it should appeal to, like, you know, a girl power audience, like, you know, in that you've got, like, a bunch of, you know, cool female superheroes, you know, teaming up. Uh, like, the look of it is really cool. Um they, you know, like the the outfits they've chosen are really cool and have like a lot of like girl appeal. Like all of Margot Robbie's outfits that they've shown in the trailers oh and what have you so far. I'm like, oh, she looks so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I would so. wear that gold onesie thing. You know yeah, that I would she's probably got, wear like, loads of great outfits and stuff. <laughs> I'm but, so into um, it. But it's... I also think, you know, uh, it's 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 got an R rating. It's supposed to be like from all the like sort of buzz that I have heard. It's mm -hmm. like kind of got this ultra-violent, like, aspect to it as well, that, like, you know, like, it's an R-rated superhero film. Again, those have done quite well so far. Um, when you look at, you know, Joker, and you look at um, Logan, and particularly the one that it, this is getting compared to now is Deadpool. Right. Uh, so, you know, if you're going in and you're getting, like, a zany Deadpool vibe from it, and it's, like, ultra-violent, can be R-rated, you know... Um, it should appeal to like, you know, the, as, as he says, like, you know, comic book dude demographic as yeah, well. Exactly. Now, like, I know we are all, you know, human beings and we, we, you know, we look at the opposite sex and be attracted to them as well and things like that. And you, you notice things like Liz loves an arm. We, we established that already. Liz loves an arm. Gentlemen, keep, keep those arms under your shirts. Um, but... <laughs> You know, and it's fine to go someone's attractive or what, whatever it may be, but it's just the fact that you don't get this kind of chat when it's like, oh, Superman's wearing a tight leggings, I can see his balls, or like there's not enough <laughs> balls, or, you know, get a cod piece on him. In fact, the next time a male superhero movie comes out, I'm going to comment on how they're wearing too much clothes, too many clothes. Too like, many clothes. That's the sitting is the same thing. And I'm just like, you know what? It's a frigging movie. It's not like a rom-com or something like that. It's just about women that are beating up people and getting on with it. <laughs> That's literally it. And it's a film. Guys, it's just, we have to remember it's just a film. Oh, Liz, honestly, honestly. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm like actually really stoked to see it. Yeah, um, me too. You know, I wasn't sure at first. Uh, you know, I, I was kind of like, oh, okay, this is an interesting, uh, interesting proposition because, like, it's not the traditional Birds of Prey team. So I was like, oh, well, why don't they just make it a Harley Quinn movie? Like, yeah. Um, and it looks to be like, you know, yeah, it's it's going to be mostly a Harley Quinn movie, but you're going to get these other cool characters in it as well. So why not? Um, but I just thought, as, as far as like, you know, why not just call it a Harley Quinn movie? Yeah. Um, because she is like, you know, kind of the strongest of those characters in terms of like uh, popularity. Yes. Um, yeah. But I guess like I'm I'm hoping anyway, there might be a few other standouts and perhaps they'll flesh yeah. out the universe. But I'm, you know what, Liz, I am excited for this. I'm going to say if you're calling up your local cinema asking about ticket sales, you've got a problem. And it's you. You probably need to find another hobby. Yeah, I mean, like the fact that you have time to do that. Uh, Who's got time? <laughs> and also, if you think that these ladies aren't sexy enough for you, then watch. I don't know, barbed wire or something. So just go like right. yeah, watch right, something know, there, else. If that's there are other options for you. There are other options if that's why you're watching movies. Anyway, let's move on. 
and move on to Liz's Comic Corner. Yes, it is. It's time for Liz's Comic Corner. Yay! Yes, it's time for Liz's Comic Corner. Uh, Liz, <laughs> this week we have chosen Deadpool the End. Now, why did you choose this comic this week? Uh, Deadpool the End, issue one. I, I chose this uh, because it's one shot uh, by one of my absolute favorite Deadpool writers, Joe Kelly, one of my favorite writers in general, Joe Kelly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, uh, it's an interesting little concept. So they've had this series of books at Marvel. Um, there's been a number of characters that they're going to do or have done uh, Captain Marvel, Miles Morales, Captain America, where it's basically meant to be a last story. Right. So a possible ending for the character. So you know, uh, kind of a what if type thing, because obviously these characters, you're, you know, they're not ending anytime soon. But it's a, uh, it's an interesting little conceit, and I liked it, and I thought, oh, and it's Joe Kelly writing it, uh, so absolutely, I want to read that. So tell uh, me about Joe Kelly a little bit more about Joe Kelly, because I have to admit, um, and you sent me a couple of pictures here. We've got one off of Superman Action Comics, um, and the next one coming up will be Spider Man. What is it about Joe uh, Kelly that you love so much? Oh, I just think he's such a good writer. I just absolutely love everything he does. Like, um, that Action Comics issue was my white whale for, like, a really long time. Yeah. I could not find that issue for love nor money. It's a, oh, no. it's a brilliant issue um, that uh, really gets into the, like, sort of heart of who Superman is and what he represents. And it's a uh, it's one-off. If you find it... Uh, Action Comics issue 775, pick it up, read it. It's amazing. Okay. Um, don't have to have read any of his Superman run to read it. Okay. Uh, and that uh, Rhino issue uh, was, there's kind of a semi-unpopular, like, sort of era of Spider-Man called Brand New Day mm-hmm. uh, that sort of, you know, uh, it eventually, you know, sort of gained some popularity, like, by the end of it. But, uh, but it was kind of post, uh, like, this uh, long running Straczynski run that had Peter Parker and Mary Jane being married and then their marriage uh, got dissolved by by Mephisto and, you know, it was never supposed to have existed and a lot of people were angry about it. But um, what they did after that was just get this rotating team of writers on Spider-Man and they would tell kind of like short arcs, like four different writers that would tell short arcs and Joe Kelly's were always my favorite. Um, and he did this this two part Rhino uh, story um, that was absolutely beautiful. If if you find uh, I can't remember what the issue numbers are, but uh, I think it's like six seventeen uh, something like that. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's really great. Uh, and he's done things called um, there's there's a really famous one that he did called I Kill Giants. If you've never read that, it's amazing. Okay, all absolutely right. Amazing. They've turned it into a film, which I still haven't seen the film, but the story is beautiful. Um, so I, I just love his stuff, and his Deadpool run is hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. So uh, and let's I, it, let's get. And I I just want to say before we finish the Spider Man thing, like this this cover, Liz. Oh my god, yeah. it's incredible. That cover it's looks so, so good. great. Like just and like you don't have to have read any of that run of Spider Man to read it. It's like it's a two issue okay. story um, about the Rhino, and it's it's lovely. Because I think that's the I think a lot of potential comic book fans get daunted when they go oh but where do i start where I know, do i start like, like, yeah i think it is issue 617 i want to say it's like oh, okay well i haven't read the other 616 issues mm-hmm. do i have to have read those it's like no actually you don't so, um so let's in, go in that case. let's go back to deadpool then now first of all before we delve into the comic let's talk about the character on film D- did you quite did you like Deadpool? I think Ryan Reynolds did a really good job of Deadpool. So I loved it. I do, loved it. Yeah. Do you think that, you know, for people that love the films and never read the comics, they would see that reflected in the comics and back again kind of thing? How do you think somebody would find picking up a comic, a Deadpool comic? Oh, I think, like, I honestly think the film did such a good job with, like, what I thought, like, was, you know, almost an impossible task of getting Deadpool right on screen. But they did it. I was, I was so impressed. Um, that they managed to do it. And uh, and I think that, you know, if you've seen the film, absolutely, you could pick up almost any Deadpool comic and, see, you know, and, and get that same feeling, okay. uh, that same vibe that you got in the film. And, like, De- Deadpool is also really easy to dive into, 
I find, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, because I'll, there'll, there'll be periods where I won't follow the book, like the main book, and then I'll feel like catching up. And, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether or not I've read it from the beginning, I can, you know, I can kind of work it out, because it's a very episodic, you know, um, and usually, it you know, you get like a pretty full story in just a single issue, because it's all comedy. So it's like, you know, it's easy to dive in. No. Deadpool then I really enjoyed reading this now I've not read a Deadpool anything Deadpool actually uh, since the Deadpool and Cable sort of vibe that I went through like a number of years ago there are a million endings in this because they've done it in a very Deadpool way so this perfectly yeah. so describe I've, I've got I've got some images coming up on screen now and um there are it starts off the longest story is at the front of the comic and it's pretty much him and his daughter and you know you've still got those quips and things but there are some nice moments as well and then death comes into it so just describe what happens on this okay, comic i love this i actually okay so uh the like the first story that you get um you're thrown in and deadpool is trying to kill death uh, and like, if you know much about Deadpool, uh, Deadpool is in love with death. This is like a long running thing. Um, and so it's, it's very, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, why would he be doing that? He's obsessed with death. He loves death. Um, but as you get further in, you find out that there's a reason, um, uh, which is he wants his daughter to carry on living. He can't imagine living in the world without her. And this is set in the far future. Um, where she's now very old, she's like in her late 90s, and he, you know, can't let go of her. Um, it's really lovely, and like they, of course, they have this interplay where she then pulls the rug out from under him and says, well, you can't do that, you can't kill death, because that would effectively kind of just end humanity as we know it, mm -hmm. if people can't die. And, uh, and so she has devised a plan to take them both out at the same time, uh, which ends up being like really touching to me i actually read that and i was like oh that's really sweet and kind of sad. <laughs> it's quite you know, nice it's because perfect. it was oh, okay that is actually like a really perfect ending for him to go out on if that was the case and uh and that's that's what happens um but of course because it's deadpool he doesn't just stay dead you then rejoin him in the afterlife where he's in hell mm -hmm. um and there was this whole sort of double cross thing with mephisto uh, where Deadpool winds up as like the king of hell, and you <laughs> yeah. know, with death like in his arms, like as his, you know, as his paramour, and that's the end. And it's like that's a perfect ending. But there Love are it. so many endings. We uh, we there see so an Avenger style ending. We've got like Thor and things like that. We've also got um, a Hollywood. We've got a couple of Hollywood style endings as well. Now, why? What were your favorites though? Like, did you quite like the Hollywood style ending? I thought that was kind of neat because uh, you get you kind of run through this same scene with him where, you know, you you see that he's sort of like, you know, it's like a morning after type deal where, you know, him and this like, you know, character who is clearly his lover are getting ready to go out and, you know, fight crime as members of the Avengers. And uh, and you just see the other character in silhouette through most of it. And then, you know, at the end of one sequence, he flies off with captain marvel uh and you know so it's it's like oh he's he's dating captain marvel uh <laughs> and then they retell a few pages later they retell the almost the exact same scene and you see him fly off uh but it's with Iceman. uh right instead. yeah so yep. i love that uh, though like i love and you know and as well like just to go back to that with his, the moments with his daughter as well because I was quite surprised because I don't read a lot of Deadpool. I just expect him to be like a bit of a dick all the time. <laughs> and not in a bad way, like a, a kind of lovable dickhead. But I, I quite like those touching moments with his daughter when it's revealed. And you're like, oh, I, I think the way that Joe Kelly writes is that balance. And yeah, it's, it's... that's like, that's where Joe Kelly like really nails it for me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, with Deadpool and with everything else he writes, he always like finds like the heart in it. And like, you know, uh, even in, in something as ridiculous as a Deadpool comic, you could be moved, you know, by what he writes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's uh, you know, I, I thought that that first ending was just really lovely. Like, you know, when you get up to that point between him and his daughter. and um, uh, But there are a number of other endings in this. Like, you know, because there are what? Like, you know... Oh my God, I don't know how many Something like 25 different endings. Yeah, because I was uh, reading through it and I was like... 
Okay, I think I got through the first six, and then I was like, okay, and it just kept going like, on. And then you get into the rhythm of it. Uh, <laughs> it you... just gets funnier and funnier to me. Like, uh, I thought the one with, uh, which I, I think you said you had the image for, um, where it's just a piss take of DC Metal uh, was yes. hilarious. Like, that had me, like, just, you know, roaring with laughter. That's the Thor, um, this, got, like, the one we can see here with Thor and Hulk. Sort of... Yeah, that where everything's bad, everything's terrible. Like Tony Stark is like, like you know, hitting the bottle and like you know, then sparking <laughs> it to his helmet, and everything's bad and awful. And like you know, they're they're like taking the piss out of it. Like, oh, it's not 1986 anymore. Like you know, comics don't have to be dark and gritty. But there you have like Deadpool, who's like dressed as the Batman who laughs. Like you know, <laughs> which is. Uh, I love that. I, I know, absolutely love yeah, that. It killed me. No, it's, it, like this is why I love. I've, and you forget because I just if you forget for a moment, I forgot for a moment. I was like reading a Deadpool comic until you go through all those, and I was like, oh yeah, cool. And it's and you get to this bit. You get to this sort of. Um, there's a bit near the end, um, and I think or it is the end. Maybe it's the last panel. Um, I can't remember if it is, but it's like Deadpool. He's got his. Uh, I think it's a Spider-Man t-shirt on and he's like sitting like a, a big slob, he's kind of fat um, and him and Death have got this like kind of strained uh, sort of like uh, typical man and wife kind of thing typical marriage. Explain that panel then, why did you choose that image? Oh god yeah, no this was great, I loved this one this is like, you know, she's like, but you know it's like, oh, um, are you going to do those dishes? Like, you know, uh, like I've, I've got a meeting in like one of the lower levels of hell right now. And like, you know, you're, you're making me late. And uh, it's like, you know, the bored marriage scenario. Yeah. Um, and at the end, <laughs> he's like, oh, I can smell you're wearing that, like, you know, that carrion scented uh, perfume that I bought you last year. What's going on? And she's like, you know, I'm, I'm going out for coffee with Thanos. Bye. Uh, <laughs> I love it. It was a really, you know what, like, just as a kind of little one shot, if you want, like, a little kind of, like, Deadpool hit, I quite liked it because it's, I mean, as I said, I've only ever read Deadpool on cable and I'm not really, like, that big a fan of Deadpool. I can read Deadpool comics really easily because they are so easy to read. Um, but I quite like the melodrama of the X-Men. I love that. Like, I'm like, it's a soap in a comic. I love it. Whereas Deadpool's a bit like, and this, and this, and this. And sometimes that formula, although I like the way Joe Kelly wrote this, but that formula starts to get in my nerves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, you know, that's that's a valid thing. Like, you know, I think, you know, make sure you're in the mood for it. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're reading the right Deadpool book and you'll be fine. But like, you know, it, I, I think it's fine to just dip in once in a while if you just want a flavor for it. And I think this was a nice way to do it. It's like, you know, it's just a one shot. You get a lot of bang for your buck with it because you get so many different stories within it. Um, and I loved, I loved the, particularly of, of the stories, I think the first story and the last story okay. were two like really lovely endings. If this was going to be the end, I thought that was actually like a really lovely way to wrap it up. So, do you think like going back to the films now? Because some people have not completely read the, any of the comics, but would you like to see another Deadpool film? And where do you think they should go with it? Because we know there's all this news about the studios and Disney and blah 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 blah. Um, I yeah. Ideal I, world I, in Liz's head. Ideal world. What do you want to happen with Deadpool next? I. You know what? I just really loved the first two films. I thought they did such a great job with them. Uh, and I'd I'd like to see more of that. I I wouldn't really want them to change much about it. But I'd like to then see him be incorporated into the world of the MCU. That's like a, that's something I'd like to see because uh, he does play off really well against certain characters. Like he notoriously has like, you know, kind of a, an interesting relationship with Spider-Man. Uh, there's another <laughs> great uh, Joe Kelly Deadpool series. That's just Deadpool and Spider-Man, uh, which is a lot of fun. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And, and other characters like, you know, you'd, you'd really like to see him interact with. So I actually just think it would be tons of fun to keep the films as is, keep like Deadpool 3, whatever it's going to be, um, in keeping with what they've already been doing. Uh, but yeah, just like I'd love to see him in a team situation. Yeah, I think so too, actually. I would really like to see him in a team situation. I think he, that, I mean, that works well in comedy in general where you get drier characters and then you get a zanier character. It's like, it's the 
comedic formula that that works since the end of time so i can and of course we see that a lot in deadpool and then deadpool 2 uh with oh, what's her face i want to say hedonic something nasonic, oh, nasonic that's it yeah yeah Mega she's so, hilarious yeah she's uh, brilliant and i love that you know that kind of like play off between them kind of thing i'd like to see another deadpool movie but i must say liz like i thought the second deadpool movie didn't do it as much for me although i enjoyed it i think i wanted to see i would love to see more of cable in the future and then tie that into the x-men that's what i want to see i'm like all about think, future things i think that the, okay and i actually think that deadpool is the perfect conduit between okay. uh like the mcu and the x-men because i think of anything that they're going to keep as is uh from that you know, sort of pre-existing Fox X-Men universe, it's probably just going to be Deadpool. Yeah. Um, and maybe a few, a few other characters from, you know, that would interact with Deadpool, like, you know, like were in the Deadpool film, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that he could be like an interesting, like sort of like entry point into the MCU for the X-Men. Yeah. So, you know, if they, if Deadpool is the first character that they do, that's technically an X-Men character. Um, you know characters we know could be introduced there and kind of segue it in oh, pretty that. seamlessly i love that i just i just really want to see i love cable i'm just obsessed with i think cable's freaking uh, great. yeah and that's like that's so cool because oh. they can then keep josh brolin like in in the mcu yes um, oh my god and you know what liz he might have his arms out in the next movie again if if I mean, a metal arm a metal arm is like sacred I right love a metal arm. <laughs> like you know, I'm fond of like Bucky's metal arm, for example. It's like Bucky, I don't care about the the rest of it. Just keep your metal arm out, and that's and then just just be broody, and that is <laughs> that's all that you need to do. That is... exactly. <laughs> so, guys, if you have a uh, any is there any uh, young young men out there with metal arms, uh, please get in touch with uh, Liz at LizLovesArms dot com. Yep. Uh, send, send pics send arm pics please <laughs> hashtag send arm pics um liz that was the end of comic corner but um what have you got lined up for us next week we just decided this actually i think before the start so what are we reading next week is a big okay, one okay so the next week's is going to be a hefty read um it is dc's crimes of passion um it is an 80 page special um from DC Comics, uh, which is a series of, I think, 10 stories, 10 short stories by different creative teams um, about, you know, sort of crimes of passion in the DC universe, like, you know, uh, love, betrayal, that sort of thing. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and a friend of mine has written one of the short stories. His name is Jay Baruchel. So you better get your lovely little comic booky fingers on a copy straight away so you can read along with us. So we'll be reminding you again at the end of the podcast uh, what we're reading again for next week um, so you can read along with us. And Liz, you'll be popping that into the Discord as well. So, I will. Yes, so and if you're a member of the Discord, or whether you are or you're not, don't worry, we'll have links out to the Discord at the end of the podcast as well. Um, now... Let's go on to another subject here. Um, No more female reboots and remakes. (laughs) Moan, moan, moan. Let me explain, okay, because I thought what we usually do with the podcast is Liz chooses like a topical topic for the week and I kind of vibe off that. Uh, as a kind of like evergreen topic that that people just generally moan about let's read some um tweets out first liz and then we'll get into it so this is from someone called board beans on twitter again we find these they don't message us direct rumors about female willy wonka adaptation no audiences (laughs) we want more female driven stories studios hmm okay here's our old stories with it recast um audiences no studios here's ghostbusters audiences no so this person's written out um their are ex- this is the exact transcript of the meeting between um <laughs> studio and audiences <laughs> so i'm like okay um so that was one okay so that gives you a little bit of an example of where we're going with this one this is from eve K- kenainen i think it is it's is this person's name eve all female reboots of classic movies are a stupid idea in any case but apparently there are in the works all-female remakes of Lord of the Flies 
and wait for it, Fight Club. I can't <laughs> think of any movies that are more essentially male. Right, so when we say re- female reboots and remakes, I'm talking about things like Ocean's 8, right? So that was, you know, we had, it was all male cast originally in the, the, very, the old, old film. Again, it was a male cast. And then they made, they sort of not rebooted it because they do make mention of, you know, the cast and, and the, what happened before. But Ocean's 8 had a female cast. And then uh, Ghostbusters, which is one that everyone went crazy about. Okay. So we had like the Ghostbusters, a female team. So Liz, before I go on about this, what do you think about this? Um, I think it is an interesting conversation um, because there's there's like there's good arguments on either side for the fact that sure you want to see more uh, female led like you know sort of action films like uh, films that are maybe traditionally male leads um, you want there to be a balance. Uh, but does just remaking a pre-existing film that everyone knows is popular uh, with a female lead, it, it, does that is that really like servicing the cause mm-hmm. uh, the and best what, you can? What did you think about Ghostbusters? Because I have not seen Ocean's 8 and I've not seen Ghostbusters. I'll tell you why in a second, but I want to get your take on Ghostbusters because you, have you seen it? I have seen it. Uh, I did did see it. um, And I had no, like, you know, I was kind of ambivalent about, you know, whether it, you know, it it didn't bother me, certainly, that they were doing it with a female cast. Um, What concerned me more was just, okay, are they going to be able to do a good Ghostbusters movie? Like, um, because I like Ghostbusters and I want to see, you know, if they're going to bring it back, I want it to be good. So I did see it, um, and I have to say I did not love it. Um, and it had nothing to do with the cast themselves. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with uh, the direction of the film because watching it, it really smacked to me of just tons and tons of improv uh, and not a lot of script. Mm. Like, you know, the script was so kind of lost under, like, what was – really clear to me as just like you know these comedians who are very funny people having just improv and improv um and you know reshot scenes to almost work around that you know whatever jokes came out of these improv sessions so it just uh it, it was just kind of a muddled mess and like uh I didn't find it very funny unfortunately um, I I avoided it uh not because it was uh, female particularly yeah. and I avoided Ocean's 8 not because it was a female cast it was a female reboot or remake I avoided those two films because I simply well Ocean's I didn't like Ocean's 11 I didn't like any of the Oceany films right I didn't like them not into it didn't I don't like a heist movie I'm not into it the second thing with the Ghostbusters thing is I never liked Bridesmaids you know it's pretty much from the makers of Bridesmaids with some of the cast of Bridesmaids now when I watched Bridesmaids I was like there were some moments that made me go no oh, yeah, and made me smile. Um, but I, I'm, it's not my kind of film. Um, they're not my kind of cast. Um, and that's just my personal opinion. I, th- I think I would think this if I was a woman, a man, a dog, an alien. It's just my taste. <laughs> it's just I'm okay with saying that. And it doesn't make me not a feminist or not whatever. I just don't like, I don't like that cast. I don't like that kind of film. Yeah, that's fair. Like, uh, I mean, I actually did like Bridesmaids, but I didn't like Ghostbusters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it's like, because I felt like Bridesmaids actually had like a script, yes. you know, and maybe there was a little bit of improv, but I felt like, you know, with Ghostbusters, it was like a lot of improv and a little bit of a script. Um, it's not for everybody, you know, that kind of but, bride, yeah. vibe. But I think, I think like, you know, what bothered some people was just the fact that it was, uh, you know, recasting the roles or, you know, just casting an all female team. I mean, that that did genuinely bother some people in and of itself. Let's um, let's go back to this tweet here because I think some some points. So I quite agree. I do agree with this tweet from Eve uh, when they say um, you know there's rumors of an of a female reboot of Fight Club, Lord of the Flies. Uh, can't think of any more movies that are essentially more male. Um, I've got a bit of a problem with that as well. I have to say because 
those movies and Chuck Palahniuk's books and characters, and is particularly in Fight Club. I'll use the I'll use Fight Club because I've, you know, Fight Club is a film was one of my favorite films. Um, if they make it, I would watch it and I'd be curious. But it is. It's, there's no harm in having a male story for male characters it, and it's a very male film it's essentially a film about uh, toxic masculinity and men uh, living in a modern age and what it means to be male and it's a very gen x and a very male film um, and that is you know i don't understand that age group or that demographic but i loved watching it and and i think that it should stay like that and i'm happy with there being just a male fight club to change it it would change the whole feeling and vibe of what i think chuck pal nuke was trying to get across in the first i agree place. i completely agree mm-hmm. um yeah i don't i have to say i kind of have no interest in seeing like a gender swapped fight club no neither uh, do i i'm not with ghostbusters i kind of understood it because i was like yeah i mean that team could be male or female it doesn't really matter yeah. but with fight club or even lord of the flies it i think it's okay to have stories for um people of color stories for people that are men uh, for people that are men for men for women for trans people Th- those stories have to be told even just men's stories or just women's stories like i think that's okay i don't think we have to i think what hollywood are doing and i read a very interesting article um and i can't i'm just going to paraphrase bits of it now but I read a very interesting article from a very well considered, considered journalist, female journalist, and she was saying that she doesn't agree with all of the female reboots and remakes because what Hollywood are doing is, is it's, it feels like they're jumping on the bandwagon of a Me Too movement, of a a wave of fe- feminism, and it's actually taking away the importance of that by just going, just give them their female stuff instead of actually right. and going. I think there's a level of cynicism about it as mm. well. Um, you know, that instead of just like, you know, crafting really good films that, you know, happen to have a female lead. Yeah. Um, why don't we just chalk women into like these like, you know, sort of traditionally male roles and that will be really successful. Yeah. Um, I don't you know. I feel like there's there's something cynical about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I agree and, with you. It's just more of a kind of I think it's to hit. I mean, you know, because I come from a marketing background, so my brain goes, they're hitting demographics. They're trying to hit a demographic. It's like they're trying to get the money and hit a demographic. And and I kind of feel sometimes even with like, the co- uh, sort of the controversy that that's good for them because it's news. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit on the fence with it. I think I interviewed Anne Hathaway last year. That interview never went online. And I asked her about the hustle um because that's a that's a female remake as well and um i said what do you think about female people who say this about female reboots and remakes and she said i think there's a space for everyone and everything i thought that response was con- well considered but also that not considering that actually every human being and and men and women and everyone in between have different experiences we can't just like, you know, we're changing the roles around to, so that there's black people instead of white people or whatever. It's just have, like, just, I want to hear the stories from the other side. It's like, let's hear men's stories, women's stories, black people's stories, trans people's stories. I think it's important, you're right, to just write those stories. So I don't have a problem with them. I'm not, not particularly enamored with going to see these kind of films because I'm like, I just want to watch a good film. But I, I mean, keeping it positive, because <laughs> this is positive nerd, we're getting, we're getting a bit serious. Let's think about let's think back to Sigourney Weaver playing Ripley in Alien. There you right. go, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's a, just a good yeah. film. It's just a it's well just written a film. Role. I feel like yeah, I feel like the you know I you know, and that's something where I don't feel like a you know, a cynical vibe like like I'm sort of being mm. marketed at. Um when you just have a really good film that happens to have a female lead. Yeah. Um and and that's just you know, that's just the way the film is like you know like with ripley uh like with you know uh the hunger game series uh for exactly. example like those were hugely popular um across all the demographics because they were just good movies and you know the fact that you, your lead was female was just an aspect of it it didn't exactly. matter exactly and you know like i mean i frigging love like love there's a couple of actresses older actresses now that i love and jamie lee curtis is one of them because i think she's a legend and sigourney weaver is incredible um 
I, I love the way that, that Ripley was written throughout the films. And, you know, when, you know, they have that sort of maternal instinct kick in in the second film. And it's not like anyone went, oh, she can't have a maternal vibe and, you know, do the flamethrower thing because she's trying to protect the child and she's also trying to be motherly, so she can't use a flamethrower. We just accept that she's a woman in a really hard situation. There's That's coming out, but she's still tough. She's just a well-written character, just a completely yeah. well-written character, and I like that. And I never once look at things like that or Sarah Connor and go, Sarah Connor is essentially her role, her first and foremost in the films is the fact that she's a mother. She's a mother, yeah. and then she's a soldier. She's just trying to protect John Connor. And that's okay. It's okay yeah. like to just be female, be male, whatever. That's why I watch Predator for the big, muscly, oily, like, 80s-ness <laughs> and the macho-ness. And I watch other films for other characters. You know, I'm happy to have both. Also, Annihilation. Have you seen Annihilation, Liz? I haven't, no. Annihilation. Uh, but, uh, I... It looks very good. It's got Natalie Portman in it. Uh, it was like a Netflix original. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think you would like it. It's another Annihilation uh, directed by Alex Garland. And it's very, very good. Um, it's sort of derived from a book. And I've not read the book. But it's the all it's all female. All, sort of all of leads are female. And Natalie Portman's the main character. Again, I'm not looking at them going, they're women. I mean, we could probably recast this and do it as men. They're just very well written. And then we look at Kill Bill, and she's become a bit of an icon now, actually, in yeah. amongst, I would think, for a different sort of generation. She she has probably become a bit of an icon as well. And she and her she, her whole thing is like scorned women, and that's and that's where she she takes it, and she's just like, and that's why I love it because she's reacting in the way that she would. I don't know, like, what do you? I feel like I'm like erring towards the. Get rid of all female reboots and remakes. But I think they should. Ex I feel you like know. I feel like I you know I feel like I'm always more excited by um, something where it just seems organic and genuine and not gimmicky. Um, yeah. I, you know, but I also feel like you know in the right hands a remake can be treated really respectfully and they and can be clever and yeah. can you know uh, can surprise me you know with. Uh, with whatever you know it, it's all about craft and whether or not they really you know uh put the time in to you know to make it not just a sort of like headliney you know clickbaity type thing yeah uh, that it so. happens to be women i think it's you know it, it's all going to come down to whether it's a good story i think you're right i think it's more about writing i think films like Ghostbusters for me, and and clearly from your sort of mini review of it, I'm never probably going to want to watch this film unless it's on TV or something, and I just happen to put yeah, it. I mean, it's, oh. it's like it's not the worst thing you'll ever see, but it's just you know. But the fact uh, is, women, I don't care, and I think no. the main thing is like when people are angry about stuff like this, don't be angry at the filmmakers and angry at the the actresses or whoever it is starring in the film they're just trying to do their jobs you know support the things that you love and if you don't love something you don't have to support it it's really that simple i think as well hollywood might need to learn some lessons we have to be balanced i guess and i do think just making female versions for the female market's sake for feminism's sake is also not right because it dilutes the argument so I it think does. we have to both meet in the middle and think, let's just, as you said, just make some good shit, basically. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. write it well and make some good stuff. Anyway, like, so I think, you know, I'm kind of trying to be positive about that. I think I think we got there, right? Yeah? Yeah, got... I think so. <laughs> I think, and I think it is, you know, I think it is positive to, to want uh, things to be as good yeah. as, they can they should be yeah. you know yeah i don't want things to fail i'm not like that bald guy that's like you know why it's going to fail i want things to do well you know what if ghostbusters did really well like as in critically and everything and i think it actually did fairly well but if it was like a critically acclaimed film and it was just purely positive i would have been like well done well, that's really I know. great I, like, I, yeah i think it is because i think it's because you know as a Ghostbusters fan, it's like, oh, you know, that's something that's a little bit sacred to me. And I think that's how people mm. feel about these things. And if, you know, if you feel like they're trying to make like a cheap buck from it or they're not going to treat it respectfully, that's when people get worked up. Yes. And uh, 
So I want to, you know, if they're going to slap Ghostbusters on, you know, on a film, like, I, I want it to be a good film. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, we're going to see how that's handled later in the year, you know, because, yeah. and I think I might then, I might break my thing of not watching it and watch it before the, the next one comes out just to get a feeling of how different it is. But I think we've kept it positive. I just think everyone just needs to calm down. I think the end of every podcast, it's just everyone needs to calm down. <laughs> Just, yeah and appreciate you know <laughs> just appreciate that's, that's our like stuff out there for you to watch it's um, our final thought for every podcast is like calm down and enjoy stuff god you guys it's like yeah wait wait for it to come out in the cinema before you judge it exactly oh my god like seriously and i hope i hope that when birds of prey comes out that people enjoy it and for those who don't there will be another film for you, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But remind us again, uh, before I do all the socially things and stuff, Liz, remind us uh, about the comic that we are going to read next week. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a big one. What, you said 80 pages, right? It, it, it is a hefty one. Okay. So, you know, uh, sit down, you know, make yourself a cup of coffee or tea, uh, you know, bunker in. Uh, it's an 80-page special. Uh, called DC Crimes of Passion, and it's by a bunch of different talented writers and artists. I think it's ten short stories, and uh, it looks it looks fun. Brilliant! I can't wait. I'm really really looking forward to that actually next week. Um, okay, so Liz, we're going to do all the professional social media bits now. Um, so tell me, Liz, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on at Liz C Jordan on Twitter and Instagram nice and easy she's so on brand and i am a we clear on twitter or we clear here on instagram so that's where you can find us online um when it comes to subscribing you can subscribe to this podcast on itunes and spotify it gets within 48 hours of it of us recording this live it goes straight out onto spotify and itunes um you can also watch it on youtube in the, in the next 48 hours on my youtube channel so you can subscribe to we clear here on youtube and you can download it on nerdjabber.com so liz it was absolutely wonderful as always uh i hope you enjoyed geeking out about birds of prey and all that i did yeah, of course. I mean, when you, from the first episode, you were like, it's all nerdy. This is like very nerdy. One of the nerdiest things that I do in the week. So, Liz, have a good week. I will see you next week. Um, everybody, um, this was Positive Nerd Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye.